So yeah, welcome everyone uh, to the Geo Data Harvester uh, workshop today in in Python. Um, we are very happy to all have you here. You know, I'm I'm uh, dialing in from Darawal country and just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, um, which the university campuses stand and where we, where we are all dialing in from. Um, so you know, we appreciate the continual transfer of learning that we've. Uh, still try to embody uh, today across that custodianship. And so today we're all here hopefully to learn um, about this AgriFed Geodata Harvester, um, which I'll explain very high level and we'll get down to the, the weeds of it all very, very quickly. Um, so I'm Nathaniel Butterworth, feel free to call me Nate. Uh, I've got a couple other people online who are here to, to help out. Um, Seb and Janwara in, in here, hey. who are the the devs on the project. Um, Henry is a, is another dev who um, who's a Python expert and, and knows about other parts of this project. And uh, Tom may also be here as well, who knows nothing about uh, Python but knows a lot about uh, agriculture. So so we've got a, a, a good team here. And uh, also, Nate looks like Chow has managed to make it in. So we've got another pretty good snake charmer in the Fantastic. audience. Fantastic. So plenty of people to to help out if we get stuck at any point. Um, and so, yeah, we're all from a place called the Sydney Informatics Hub. Um, that is a, a core research facility at the, the University of Sydney. And um, we do all things across the informatics spectrum, which, which includes sort of high performance computing, data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, statistics, bioinformatics um, and we kind of work as uh, internal consultants to the rest of the university. So we have a lot of good collaborations, um, both internally and externally and AgriFed, the, um, the Agricultural Research Federation of Australia. Uh, we have a, a partnership with them at the moment to, to develop this product. Pro product. And uh, where they have members all around um, the country, which most people here are probably uh, aware of. So, so one of their, their core missions, I guess, is to enable uh, this findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, uh, you've probably heard that this fair uh, data practices, um, and they specifically want to target agricultural data to accelerate innovation and increase the profitability and sustainability of Australian agriculture. And uh, so that is what this geodata harvester um, tool does. It, it, it tries to make the, uh, the, the, the process of uh, downloading data from multiple different sources um, simultaneously and, and get, uh, get, get all those data sources wrangled into like the same format and the same, uh, the same dimensions and everything. And, and then be able to take that, that sort of workflow to download that data set and give it to someone else and say, if you run this, you'll get exactly the same uh, download um, downloads and, and data set that, that I produced earlier. So that's the, the overarching goal of this, and we'll see how everything works uh, coming up. Feel free to interrupt at any time as well and ask questions if you uh, if you have any. I guess I've already introduced um, most of us. Um, we also have Chow here as well, who's, who's joined in, which is fantastic, um, but that's us, so. All right, so as, as I mentioned, um, the, the data harvester. So it, it used to be called a data harvester, but we, we kind of uh, rebranded uh, to the geo data harvester before our first, um, I think, public release. And uh, so you might see that, that term crop up a few times. Um, yeah, the idea is to, to retrieve, uh, and also everyone can see my screen, right? Um, please, uh, please let me know if, if I'm talking to the wrong, wrong stuff. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, the idea is um, a, a couple of steps in the data harvester is to re firstly retrieve the data. So we have multiple different sources uh, where data resides on, on different um, different websites. And we've tried to kind of amalgamate many of the, the major ones, um, especially used in agricultural research uh, to begin with. And uh, each of those has sort of different ways, you know, you go on the website and you click a button and you select some parameters and you click download. Um, and, and a few, uh, and, 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 and they also generally offer what's called an, uh, an API, uh, which is an application programming interface, which just lets you 
kind of automate that process. But then all the APIs for those different websites are all different. Um, so we've kind of tried to pull a lot of them together uh, to make it a bit more seamless and also to do it in a um, reproducible fashion. So that, that's the idea. And um, we'll dig down into that. Uh, and then we, the, the Geodata Harvester also has some, um, some you know, processing steps, just uh, some, some light processing to kind of uh, make your data sets uh, more, more meaningful before you get to the actual data that you need, um, which could be some sort of um, uh, point location um, or something. Yeah, so we, we process it and then uh, have a final output at the end. Well, we'll see all that happen very quickly. Uh, and, and yeah, that, so there's kind of three products uh, underlying the, the Geodata Harvester uh, umbrella. There's the, the Python um, Geodata Harvester that we'll be using today. Um, there's also the, the EE Harvest Python package, um, which does a lot of the, the work under the hood for interfacing with Google Earth Engine. And there's also the, um, the R Data Harvester uh, package as well. So that wraps uh, a lot of the Python tools up and exposes their functionality in R. Uh, so if you prefer R, you can kind of do all the steps that we're doing today uh, in R instead of Python. But today we'll, we'll get it um, obviously in Python. Okay, so session one today, we're going to uh, dig deep into the, the what's known as the, the YAML file. This is basically the recipe for our data download. So what sources we're going to download and, um, and, and sort of the time scales of downloads uh, and the location. So that kind of thing, uh, resolution. And this is where all these parameters are set. This is sort of the driving force of the Geodata Harvester um, is you set everything up in this uh, YAML file and then you go from there, you click, click run and hopefully everything should be returned nicely. So this recipe file will um, would be the kind of thing that you could give to someone else or reuse in the future or uh, make slight changes to, and um, you should be able to uh, have very reproducible data sets. All righty, so that, that's that's all I'm, I'm gonna talk about at the moment. Are there any questions yet? We're still warming up. Feel free to uh, to ask questions if needed. Otherwise, I'm going to get stuck into kind of the uh, the notes of everything. So let me just reshare uh, part of my screen. Um, I'll just share. Yes, share. Let's share this. All righty, hopefully everyone can see um, just the, the Geodata Harvester window there. And um, I'm just on the, the, the notes page, so mine might look a bit a little bit different because I've kind of collapsed it in. So um, I'm just sharing kind of half a screen. So you have half a screen on, on your local machine to, uh, to, to work on. And I'm just gonna go to the Python workshop um, page. And uh, you probably have a, a side menu that you can uh, click through. And we'll start with just the let's let's go to the um, first the we're here okay so I'm just going to click on the uh, setting up Google Earth Engine now uh, hopefully beforehand everyone uh, has applied for Google Earth Engine access so the way they kind of allow people in or out of the program I think Google's constantly in beta uh, this this might still be in, in beta. Um, and that's why you kind of have to do this manual onboarding of saying like, yes, I wanna use the Google Earth Engine um, uh, tool, but and here's the reason why. And, and that reason can be as simple as, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a researcher, I'm interested in uh, downloading the data. And uh, it, when, when you fill it in, I, I don't know anyone who's been not allowed uh, to join up. So hopefully that'll work for you. And then once you have access, um, your Google account will, will have access to it. Uh, and, and then, so that's one part of the process. We'll, we'll go through the second part of the process of uh, actually sort of authorizing our, um, our, uh, our, our workstation to, to access the Google Earth Engine API. Um, but I'll talk more about that shortly. Okay, let me go. Python. 
Okay, so the second part is all about setting up our um, Python environment. Actually, I'll just stop for a second. Has everyone got a Google Earth Engine access? Has anyone not got it? Fantastic. Good stuff, good stuff. All right, thank you. Yep, speak up if, if you need to, or yeah, I, normally the onboarding takes more than 30 seconds. So that, that's why we wanted everyone to do it sort of beforehand. But you only have to do that once. Um, okay, now we will be using uh, just a, a hosted Python environment today. And if, you, if you've used Python much at all, uh, you'll know that every machine is different. Everyone has uh, using Mac or Windows or, or Linux and different versions of that. And then they'll have different versions of Python. Some people will be using the, the system Python, some will be using uh, Anaconda Python and so on and so forth. So there's lots of different uh, versions. So in order to make sure uh, everything works nicely, we're just using an online environment. Um, the instructions for setting up on your local machine are there though. And in theory, it should be pretty um, pretty straightforward, but there's just lots of uh, lots of idiosyncrasies where, where things can um, be a little different. And that's why we're, we're using the, the hosted environment. Um, but by all means, if you are using the a local option. Um, we probably won't have time to, to troubleshoot in, in class, but you can shoot us a message and we can we can help you offline. Um, but if you're using this one, which I hope you all are, I'll click that link. And let's see. So I'm going to sign in um, with AAF. So this will look different um, depending on what organization you're at. Um, so I'm just sort of clicking through the options there. Um, if anyone is uh, is not familiar with this process or um, or it doesn't work for them, reach out because we we have some um, uh, we have some spare usernames um, to use specifically for this. So I'm I'm going to log in with a um, um, sort of a blank Canvas account that I can. Um, so I get the same experience as everyone uh, signing in for the first time. Here we go. Good stuff. Yes, I, I trust it. And you can uh, approve this connection. Okay, so you'll, you'll be presented with a couple of server options. Um, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what's in these other ones, but they're probably um, sort of like core Python libraries and, and other things. But today we're using the AgriFed Python environment um, for our for our experience, and that's the one I'll click on and click start. And so on this um, on this environment, we have all the kind of dependencies and sub modules and and packages that that are required uh, to use all the functionality of the GeoData Harvester. Um, so if, yeah, again, if you're familiar with Python, it, it just installs. Um, certain versions of, of packages that are required um, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel from scratch and that's why we use these environments with um, dependent packages okay so that should just take a minute or so cool so again if you're not familiar with um, sort of the python experience uh, there's lots of different ways to interface with the python programming language but today we're using something called uh, a jupyter notebook or maybe it's a, it's a, a jupyter notebook this specific IDE is known as a Jupyter Lab. Um, so just giving you some terminology. And so on the left-hand side, you have kind of your files. And on the right-hand side um, at the moment is sort of like where, where I can type things in. And I'm just gonna launch um, an IPy kernel Python 3 notebook file. And that will uh, give me sort of this window. And now it's sitting here waiting for me to sort of type things in and say, hello world. Yay, and then I can run it and it will print out hello world. How's everyone going? Everyone managed to, to get on? Um, see, John doesn't have one. Um, do you, can um, someone message John Harris, the cr credentials maybe, um, what did I, I use user two, maybe user three. And so John should be able to get on. 
No worries, Sabin. I'm glad. This is always the most stressful part, getting getting everyone up and running. We didn't even need to use our, our backup. Okay, and uh, also maybe Alan can have number four. Someone can message Alan um, credentials. Let me know if, if you need them. Okay, good stuff. Um, all right, where's my mouse? So I'll go back to the notes. Um, and yeah, so that, that, that's basically it for the setup. Um, and let's go here. I'm going to go back to the Python workshop and I'm going to go to session one. Um, the session one uh, page here. And I'll just be following these notes along. Um, so I'll switch back and forth to, to see where I'm up to. I'm going to be doing a lot of um, uh, live programming. So, so you guys will have to um, sort of follow along with that. But I will be following these notes in the, um, in, in the background, even if you, uh, even if it doesn't look like it. That's generally what I'm following. Okay, and I'm just waiting up. So uh let me just share someone's asking for the usernames and passwords um, yeah, i think we have a, a critical mass of of everyone online so I will um, kick off. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is just copy this line. So we need to move um, uh, some some data over uh, on, onto this server that we've got. And I guess this is the equivalent of you might need to download something, or um, or you might need to yeah put put data where you need it to be. And the way we're going to use this, uh, do this is is using um, a tool called Git. So you might be familiar with Git. You don't you don't have to be. Um, but we're using Git under the hood. So I can just click this here and click copy. And I'm gonna to go to my Jupyter Lab and I'm just gonna paste that in there. And you can see that it's um, it's pasted in there. And now to run this, I can either click that play button up there or I can just press shift enter. And you can see, hopefully it should download 22 megabytes of, of data, 23 megabytes. Um, and it puts this folder over here on the left-hand side called AgriFed Workshop. And inside there, there should be a, um, a, a readme file and a data folder. And so in this data folder, this is the, the data that we um, that we'll be using today, sort of different, different things that, that I'll be going through in context. And I'll talk more about that in a second, but I'll get the second um, thing running as well. Now, the only thing that's missing from this online environment is the geodata harvester itself. But you can see sort of how, in theory, how straightforward it is to install um, when you have a, a Python environment. You just run this conda in, install line. So I'm just going to copy that one as well, conda install, um, and I'll get that running. This will take about two minutes or so. So I'll get it running whilst I keep talking. Um, so this uses, uses the, the conda uh, package, uh, conda package manager, uh, to install uh, the geodata harvester and it uses a specific uh, channel or, or, or repository known as Conda Forge. Um, so that's what these sort of flags mean. And then the, the yes means that it will automatically say yes to any questions that are asked, which is basically, would you like to continue? Um, that we'll see. So yeah, as I said, that'll take about two minutes. And um, while that's installing, I can just check. How's everyone going? Bit of a pulse check. I think this is the most challenging part of the workshop. If we can get this working, I'll be very, very happy with, with myself and everyone as well. So look, at okay, good. It's uh, solving, the environment's done. Look at that. And I can just talk you through kind of what, what's happened. Um, it's saying, you know, the, these um, packages will be will be sort of downloaded. And then, um, and then it, it all happened so quickly, they downloaded them and installed them and then it's done. I might just, let's just go, I'll just sort of show you what kind of um, is under the hood there. 
um, before I sort of get more into the notes. Do I have a link? Um, I think I have a link here. Oh, star. So the main uh, repository that we have is um, is is here, and so this is this is kind of. Um, so I'll just go there. This is where all our code uh, lives, and this is um, kind of what's what's happening kind of hood. There's some sort of content there. Um, and on this page, there is something called an environment file. So on our server, it has all these things installed. Um, if you're familiar with it, you can you can um, sort of appreciate it's using uh, Rasteria, Rio X Array, GeoPandas, Shapely, uh, NetCDF four. Um, I think should GDAL be there in, in in there somewhere as well. Um, I think oh yeah that's under the hood. Um, so yeah, if you're familiar with those packages, you might recognize them as classic Python um, sort of spatial GIS um, interactive um, uh, Python modules. And, and so we we just leverage a lot of the functionality of, of those and, and kind of tidy it up um, in the Geo um, Data Harvester. But yeah, that's that's what we're using under the hood. Uh, yeah, I, I mentioned GDAO, which is I think buried within uh, Rasteria and maybe a couple others as well, um, which we also utilize there. Um, but when when you run that conda install command, it will go and execute um, and, and basically install all these packages um, as well. So that's sort of what's happening. Uh, yeah, so if you're into source code and, and everything, you can read um, for hours digging through that. Sorry, there's a question. I was just going to point out uh, one of the dependencies is the EE harvest package, uh, which we package as individual package for just specifically the um, handling the Google Earth engine um, data sources, which has been developed by General. Good job. Yep. And, and that's an open public uh, package now, too. Yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll dig into that a bit later on. And and some of these have specific versions um, and others are flexible. Um, that, yeah, that we'll, we'll see how that goes in the future. So, uh, okay, so let's go back. Um, hopefully everyone's got everything installed. Now, the next thing um, from the notes here is to run this import command. I should have probably broken these cells up first. Um, so I'm just gonna copy that one. So I might even just type it, make everyone type it. Um, import geo data underscore harvester um, as gh. So we don't have to write the word geo data harvester all the time. Um, so that's the name of the package in Python or name of the module. And uh, I'll click run. And if nothing happens, that generally means that it, it's good. Uh, it means that that it worked so that's good yeah you, you can see that that went dark there was also a star there um but when they they disappear uh then then it's probably imported successfully without any without any issues so that's fantastic um and one one more thing i might just point out that there's an underscore there and a hyphen here so it's a, a subtle but important uh difference between the the name of the, the package and the name of the module that you import into python um, which I seem to continuously forget. At least the one good thing we have is that at least you import it, it it's not a different name than like, it's not a completely different name. Oh, absolutely. Pi, like, pi shape and shapely and shape file. Yeah. 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 As, as, as the more you work with Python, the more you'll have to just deal with the idiosyncrasies of sklearn, scikit-learn. Yeah, there, there's quite a few. So, so we're doing well, I think, a hyphen versus an underscore. Um, Okay, so then finally, the the last command that we're just going to uh, um, run in, in our in our notebook for for this session is this automated um, gh.harvest.run command, and I might just um I'll type this one out. So it um so we can say df, which is going to be a data frame, and gh.harvest. So this is from the geo data harvester package we're using a harvest module and from that module there's a function called run and we need to we, if, I, if i run that like that um you can say 
uh, it, it actually, it, it almost works. It says, oh, it's missing one required positional ar argument. And that required positional argument is path uh, to config. And so it's saying, I want, give me a YAML file, please. Give me that settings file that I uh, mentioned in the intro. And so that work, that's what we're going to pass it. Um, so inside this folder here, the AgriFed workshop, so ag, I think if you press tab, yeah, it, it will auto-complete if you don't want to um, mess up the, 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 what's that called, the camel case or something of, of the AgriFed uh, workshop. And in that, inside that folder, there's a folder called data. And we're going to run this file called settings uh, underscore session one dot YAML. And I can just go uh, prove it to myself that it's there. Let me just check. Session, yeah, settings underscore session one YAML. Um, so there's that file there. And uh, you should be able to just run that as is. I think in the notes, there, there's a couple of options called preview equals true. And we'll see what that what happens with that. And also return underscore DF equals true. So the preview will plot some pictures and the return data frame, uh, return DF returns a uh, something to work with instead of just um, downloading the data. Okay, all right. And I've already um, messed something up. So I've just missed a... So un, unterminated string literal, that just means I missed a quotation mark there. So um, that looks better. So that's all in quotation mark uh, qu quotes. So I'll give myself a bit more screen real estate. Let me know if my font needs to be bigger or anything as well. There we go. Okay, let's try again. Okay, we're working, we're running. Everyone's running okay. Hopefully you got ahead of me. But look at it go. So it's, it's gone uh, downloading, found five sources, um, uh, digital location model, landscape, radiometrics, silo, and SLGA. And now it's downloaded them. Look at that. It, it, it all worked. Um, we got a bunch of different um, files. And it's given, given us a preview, I think, of most of the files there. Uh, so yeah, the, the DEM looks like a dam, uh, a digital elevation model. Um, and yeah, they, they, these all look okay. Some of them, like the, the daily rain here, that looks a bit weird, but it could just be really low resolution. Spoiler, it is um, for, for, I think that's the, the silo data. Um, the, the coordinates there, you can get an idea of the, the scale. So that's just the um, latitude, longitude. So it's at point, point zero 0.05 of a, of a degree, which is, I don't know, how, how far is that? 100 meters or so. Um, In eight. Yep. We got a user asking uh, for you to make the screen bigger, maybe increase the font size. Is that yep. possible? Absolutely. Let's do, wait, I can do this, I can do this. Good stuff. Okay. Alrighty. So now let's talk about what we did. Um, but that, that's basically it. So congratulations, everyone. You just downloaded um, all this data from, from uh, a whole bunch of different sources, uh, did some some basic filtering and, and processing on it and um, let's have a look at what it returned so firstly if i open up my file browser um what about I, I it created this um this thing called output this folder called output which i believe um all these uh items now exist in and so that is what we've downloaded um some were kind of temporary um, files. So when you download um, uh, some of these data sources that they'll give you kind of like the whole country or, or maybe not that much, but they'll give you a, a whole, um, actually, I think some of them are kind of massive grids that you have no choice but to download the whole thing. Um, and then the data hubs that we just crop out the, the area of interest. Um, and, you know, these are, I think there's, these are just TIFF files. So I can, um, let me just download that and and we can we can even have a, have a look at it I'm just opening up um uh qgis and another window have a look at this tip file so yeah, one thing to keep in mind is whenever you're like taking a look at any of these uh, data that's downloaded from uh, a spacious source it's good to visualize it in a program like qgis or arcgis that is built for visualizing spatial data 
because sometimes if you just open it in like a regular image viewer, it'll look like nothing. That's true. Yeah, when I open it. Oh yeah, no, there, there is there's something in there. That's the uh the tiff in the Windows um preview. That was better but, than I than I thought it would. Yeah, but you'd want to play around <laughs> with the, uh, the values there to determine yeah. what what is going to be displayed. Anyway, my, my QGIS is still still booting up, um, but that's okay. I'll, I'll still got plenty to talk about. Oh, here we go. So just I guess you can also import it into any geospatial library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in R or in Python. So I go to my downloads folder landscape TIFF. Um, so I'm just importing that. Um, and I click add. Look at that. There you go. So that that's the um that's that's fundamentally what what we've um what we've kind of uh downloaded one of those layers and it's saved it saved it as a TIFF um by request. So there's a couple of options that I think we expose, um, but the default behavior is to kind of save out all these um uh, data sets as a TIFF file. Okay, fantastic. Um let me just minimize that. And now let, let's go back. So we ran gh.harvest.run on this this uh, set, settings underscore sessions dot yaml file. Um, so I'm going to go and open that file just in the browser here. So it's, it's the first one or the second one? First one. Okay. So in here, um, you can see kind of what happens. Um, under the hood and, and and also hopefully now every single person here has the exact same data sets which is um which is good it means you don't have to repackage the data and give it to someone and then you know someone will make a change and then give it to someone else um you know you can you can say hey here's here's how we downloaded it um as part of our workflow uh you can see in here the the name we have an in file so this is basically uh, a CSV which has an area of interest in it. It's a a, a, a set set of lat latitude longitude points, and um, and then we have we specify where we want our uh, output saved to. And um, I'll talk through many of these other ones as we go. Um, some other interesting ones are the, the target bounding box. So uh, I think that's a, a very important one. So you can set that kind of. Um, Bigger or smaller, but you can see ours was determined from um, uh, the, the the area that we're actually looking at. This uh, Lara site is out in um, outback New South Wales, I think, over um, near Narrabri, and is is a Sydney research um, farm or something, I believe. Um, and we've got some some date periods. So a lot of these data sets they come with some sort of temporal uh knowledge so they might be you know taken at a certain time period or they might be uh satellites that, that fly over kind of every every week or so or every what once a month and um um or or it could be like the rainfall in it happens every day but we're interested in a, in a certain time period so there's all this kind of like um yeah dimensional traits that we have kind of have to take into account when when dealing with these different data sources. And then down here, we actually have the data sources. So I've got a few commented out. Um, that was just mostly for the demo purposes, um, but you can see the, the names of, of a few of them. And we'll get into kind of like, there's no way to know off the top of your head what is actually possible to go into this, um, this recipe file, the settings YAML file, um, but we'll go into detail into how uh, how we can sort of determine what is allowed in there and, and what what doesn't make sense in there. Um, and that's basically the answer is to read the documentation. Um, okay, fantastic. Let's go back. Any questions at the moment? Oh yeah, the uh, Age of Empires 0.1. <laughs> Very good. Um, so yeah, the the... CSV site uh, is uh, are these red red dots here? Um, so that, that's the latitude longitude coordinates of those um, uh, points of interest. So it's ten past ten. Uh, we'll continue on for the next session. I'll, I'll be pretty uh, rigorous with the break. So we'll, we'll have a break in about another um, uh, ten or fifteen minutes, and.
but we'll, we'll get started on the second one. We should be able to pick up it as we go. Are there any questions at the moment? Uh, yeah, on, on my one, um, sorry, I've, I've lost it. I've got too many screens open. Uh, the, I've, I've got a, a rain, rain, a daily rain mean view and the, uh, the y-axis is inverted. So the red dots are the opposite way round to all of those. Have I done something? No, that's a, yeah, that, that's a, that's a, a bug that I've been, it's been bothering me for a while. I, I don't know why some data sets flip, flip it. I think it's the way that Python plots things. So mm -hmm. by default, it will try and um, uh, plot the data from, from, it, it should be zero, zero should be at the top and then more negative numbers uh, go down. But then I think some data sets, it, determines that it's oh it's geospatial and it flips it up the right way so mm -hmm. yeah i it, anyway it's it's basically just uh you haven't done anything wrong right no. yeah so yeah this, this daily uh daily main one here uh is the same for me okay good spotting though um okay so let's uh we'll continue to the next session then and we'll keep going. And basically we're just gonna unpack what we've done in more details. Um, oh yes, thank you for the, the hint about using PyGMT. Absolutely, that's um, the future, isn't it? Um, okay, we're going to the, the next session. I'll just post that in the chat um, to catch everybody up. And now we're gonna talk about, you know, what we actually just did then. I've gone into it in, in a little bit of overview, um, but in more detail, we, are going to look at how we can modify this settings file uh, to make it do things uh, that we want and talk in detail about it. So if you haven't it dealt with a, a YAML file before, it, it's basically yeah a human readable, um, what is it? I forget what it stands for, yet another markup language, I think. Uh, no, yeah. it stands for oh, YAML, YAML ain't ain't markup, markup language. language. Okay, it's sorry. Markup. It's okay. a... People who think they're very smart, they're like, it's a recursive acronym. Yeah. The acronym is included within itself. <laughs> very good. Okay. So it's, um, uh, yeah, if, if you haven't used a, a markup language before, it's basically a human readable um, a way to organize data, I suppose. Um, so uh, the native Python um class of, of or um, type of, of data is called a, a dictionary, I, I guess. And, and so you have like a, um, uh, the, the, the key, which is the name, and then you have a value. So um, that's basically how this works. And, and in our case, we can sort of nest that um, as we need to. But yeah, the idea is that you have this key, which, which represents um, some sort of a category, and then the values of that category. So that's, um, that's basically what uh, YAML is. And so that's all we're using. We haven't reinvented anything for this. Um, um, and that's the style that we go. And so let's um, let's sort of, we're gonna step through this sort of one by one by using uh, this, um, this very basic YAML file. So this would be sort of the most fundamental um, geodata harvester YAML settings file that, that we could use. So um, this is a file called basic config. So in my, in here, I have in my data, I've um, got this file called basic config. So I'm gonna open that up. So I'm gonna close that up. And uh, yeah, you can see in there, uh, so this is the output path relative to where the code is executed from. So keep that in mind, even though it's in a couple of subfolders, um, where we are running. So if I go back to my notebook and I can type, I think this works, EWD, it says I'm in home job yan. Uh, so that, that might be the same or it might be different depending on, on your, um, on where you are, but it basically means where in this directory here. So this top level directory uh, re represented by the, the slash. Um, and so if I go back to my settings file, my basic config file, sorry, 
uh, it's going to create a folder there called results basic when we run this. Um, and then we have our bounding box. Hopefully that's clear. Uh, longitude, um, what it would have got left, top, right, and bottom. So again, like there's no way to know that unless you read the, the documentation and know that uh, we have de defined um, the, the latitude and longitude bounding box as um, to be read in as the left, top, right, and then bottom uh, values. And because that's the way we'll try and uh, chop up the data and download it, download the area of interest. Okay, then the next thing is the target resolution. So a lot of the data um, sources, they, you know that they have the the different tiles of, of resolution and uh and that they take they some of them wanted in uh decimal degrees others wanted in um in sort of meters and everything so we have decided that the input is in um in arc seconds that, that so Nate, what's the default uh projection or crs that we're using uh i it's wgs 84 it, it it is just wgs 84 and um and that can be changed also which we'll we'll dig into um so that that option is available yeah so um some sources allow you to change that uh yeah so we'll we'll dig into that in the, the third session where we can set that option uh, and then I've mentioned the yeah the the date range. So basically, we we need a date range for um, the data. Some some of the data sets are, are static, but um, others they they do require a date range. And finally, we we get to the the fun part, which is where we actually want our target sources from. And so for this um, basic config, we're just going to download the uh, Landsat Barris Earth image from uh, the DEA data source. So I might, um, I'll start a new notebook for this. So new notebook. Um, I'm gonna use a Python 3 kernel, but just to keep things contained. And let's go, um, I'll go back to the notes here. Okay, so we have our basic config already set for us. So I'm gonna uh, import the geodata harvester again. Let me just hide my, and so import geodata underscore harvester as gh. Okay, that's good. I should mention if if you log out of um, this Jupyter Hub instance uh, hosted by by the Nectar Research Cloud, um, that that's just that's where it's hosted. If you log out of it uh, and then log back in, you'll have to reinstall the geodata harvester. So it's kind of like a temporary thing. You can make it persistent, but um, kind of design that to, to do that okay so I've, I've imported that's that's great and uh again we, we're going to just run that um uh do the harvest.run so and paste that in so gh which is the geodata harvester using the harvest module um and the run function in the harvest module and then we just have the one required argument there which is the name of the the yaml file so i click run and look at it go. Oh, that was, that was very quick. Downloaded it and I should be able to see. Yes, I now have a folder called results basic. And in there, um, there's a couple of log files that have been created um, and also the actual data itself, Landsat Barrister. Earth. So good stuff. Um, everyone comfortable with that? Let me know if there's any questions. Everyone seems to be feeling feeling good about it. Um, okay, and and a bit bit of a fun fun thing you can do, you can actually just run it again. And look at that, it detects it already exists, so it, it'll skip the download, um, which will save you. A, this is a bit of a test today. You know, we've got uh, thirty five people all downloading from the the one source um, uh, at the same time. So so hopefully we don't break any of these um, repositories. So if it exists, we won't um, sort of spam the system. Um, however, keep in mind that if, it, if a different file with the same name exists, it will sort of detect that and, and won't override it. So, okay. All right, now we can uh, edit uh, this to add even more, um, more sources to download. I might just, um, as we do, 
So you can see we add this DEA source and we can add, add these extra ones to our um, basic config, DEM landscape silo. So I can just copy those lines at the bottom there. I'll go back to my, um, to, to my basic config here. So where's my basic config? I need to view my, oh, need to view my top, um, basic config. And if I just paste it down there, I don't think the um, indentation matters. Uh, you can see that it's sort of messed up there, um, but I'll make it make it consistent anyway. Python code indentation matters, but for like a YAML file, I think it can it can deal with that. All right, you can see the the it's a full black circle. So I, if I just click save, save YAML file, or Control S and save that file, and now I go back to my um, here, and I can just rerun the same line. And you can see it, it saw the first one and it said, oh, that one already exists. I'll skip that one. But now you've got all this new, new stuff in there. So um, I'll download that and I can run it again. And you can see it just finds everything this time. And go back to my results basic. And you can see that it's, it's filling up with um, lots of data there. Very good. Okay, let's, um, let's just go. I'm just going to open up a uh, home page here and we'll, we'll just go in and have a look at some of these data sources. What time? 10.20. So I've got a couple of minutes. Um, we'll, we'll just have a, a quick look at where we're actually uh, getting this data from. So if, if you're not familiar, um, so what do we start with? We can start with this SLGA um, site here. So we're downloading data from uh, the Soil and Landscape Grid of Australia. And um, you know, to, to get the data, I guess you'd traditionally go to sort of file download here. Um, and then it says you know, how to access uh, the, the data. Um, so it can be downloaded via FTP, um, or you can use the CSIRO DAP um, downloader. And, and we can go there and we can um, sort of dig through it all data let's see i'm trying to find a, an easy example okay so soil landscape tasmania three inch resolution there's some data there and then the files are in here um and here we go so then, then we can start uh downloading some of the data here that i think they're just sent as zip files um this file is not currently for immediate download. You may request it, um, which is a shame. So uh, you know that, that's a, uh, that's a bit of a bit annoying. Can I do this. No, I won't. I won't do this. But ba basically, all the different um, data sources have sort of something like this. But then they also let me see. Where's the API? R package. Okay, I'm looking for the, the documentation about the API. That's right, we'll, we'll go to another one. So the silo climate database. Um, also, yeah, you, you're faced with some kind of interface like this where you set what year you want and everything. And, and obviously you can see how this might be very uh, very cumbersome um, to, um, to do manually. And then um, there, so thank you, Seb. I'll, uh, um, maybe I just quickly jump in for the yeah. SLGA data. Um, there's also an attribute about uh, depths. So you can download at certain depths, like from zero to five centimeter, 10 to 20 centimeters, um, and there are options. Um, so we leverage the uh, web map server. Um, it's based on CSIRO and that activates um, SLGA data, mm -hmm. which is then possible basically to leverage uh, bounding boxes. Um, so it cuts automatically out the uh, region as, as well as you can specify which, which layers, which depth to select um, automatically there. And Silo um, is not based on a map server. That is actually a static data set um, hosted on AWS uh, S3 bucket, I think. And that downloads actually, um, given a certain namespace, um, the, the data sources from there. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, so so you might notice when we download a silo one, I think we download a year at a time, um, and, and so they they quite big those files. Um, but yeah, and as as I said, you can see sort of if you wanted to go in and download, you know, nineteen eighty four, and you told someone, oh yeah, that's the the data set that um, you need, 
Um, also, a lot of these have licensing restrictions, like you can't repackage them, I think. Maybe, maybe that's not true for these data sets. You can sort of reshare them as much as you want, but some data sources, you, you can't kind of just share the data. Um, so that's also uh, a good reason for the, um, the data harvester. Uh, okay, and uh, yeah, you can sort of browse through these, uh, the, the other ones if you're not familiar with them. Um, but basically they all have sort of different mechanisms to download and we've just tapped into it um, to, to automate the process. Um, but as I said, there's, there's no way to kind of know um, what we've, what is um, available in, unless you kind of uh, read through the documentation and uh, look at our examples, the downloads and everything. So, and we're also going to, um, the, the widgets where we manually pick things uh, shortly in the next session. Okay, so we'll get to the next part um, after a break. So let's have a let's have a ten minute um, break, and then we can come back and and have a chat and everything, and keep going with the session. So we're just up to um, just up to this section, just below the adding multiple data sources. Um, so I'll leave that on. Not even. Uh, let's do that. So yeah, we'll come back in, in, in 10 minutes and um, we'll see you soon.
Hi, Alan. Yes, I, I can show you that. Um, let me get on the right screen. So then, oh, now we've got too many tabs open. Okay. Um, so mine, my uh, idea is a little bit different just because I'm, I'm squishing it all into the space so everyone can see. Yeah. Um, but basically on the, the left-hand side, yours probably looks close to this. On the left-hand side is the, the file navigator. Mm -hmm. Um, so once you open up kind of any file, um, so if I, open, if I double click on one of those, then up the top, you have the different, um, you've got different tabs. Yeah. So I, I have two notebooks open. One was from the first session. And one was from this second session. Um, and then I also have the, um, let me close this so we can read it. And, and then I have the, oh, okay. the, the files up there. Um, yeah, so, so basically if, if you, you can all, if, if you close it down, like you can just go and, and I can close everything and, um, and just go back and open up things as I need. So I've got my, my notebook and I've got my, basic config I think it was that one yeah does that make sense yeah that makes sense thank you okay. good stuff right cheers I just missed that I was a bit late in getting a, a um uh, a login and then I had to try and catch up but I think uh, I right yep yeah, awesome. fantastic all right well, welcome uh back everyone I was just uh going through some Jupiter uh lab um uh, operations. So yeah, if you're not familiar with this environment, it, it can be a, a little tricky to um, to navigate. And yeah, there's subtle differences, even if you've used Jupyter Notebooks before, so a Jupyter Lab environment, or if you've used something like Google Colab, which is kind of like Jupyter Lab, but it's got a fancy skin on it. Um, yeah, it can be, be a little bit confusing. <clears throat> okay, so let me just check in um were there any other questions that people wanted to to cap, catch up on before we forge ahead all good all right so um close the tabs again might revisit some of these do you have a start index okay, that's the main page okay so we're back we're here in the notes. Um, oh, that isn't, sorry, I sent that to the wrong person and I also didn't send the right thing. Um, we are here in the notes um, that I just posted in the chat. And we've, we've just sort of added those extra things to our basic config uh, YAML, YAML file. Um, and we haven't run it yet though, have we? did we run it? Oh, you know, sorry, we did, um, uh, uh, but this time we're gonna run it again. Um, so there's a couple options. So if I, um, if I press comma and then, I um, know oh, that, that, that doesn't work, does it? Sorry. Um, if, if I press comma up here, so I can see, um, and we're going to add the, these extra options here, the, the log name and the preview equals true. So uh, the log name is, is it log underscore name? Let me check, log underscore name. So this is an option, log underscore name. Um, equals hey Nate because would would tab com, tab completion show that or so yeah so if, if there's nothing there um it doesn't it oh. uh, it shows everything oh, I think God. every every Python option available yeah. if you press log log name there it is yeah param so yeah if you press tab uh, you can probably find one of these parameters that are available. Um, that seems to be the only one starting with L. 
But so, so the log name is an option that we can add to this uh, run function and we can give it a, the, the name of a log. So we could, we could call this, um, uh, maybe I should follow the notes. So if I have the, the same thing, multi underscore config. Um, so you can call it whatever, whatever you like, but uh, in the notes it says multi underscore config. Uh, and, and then that will be the name of our log file. Um, so you might want to change the name of the default log file or um, for some reason. And the other thing in the notes that we're going to do is set the preview to equal true. So we saw when we downloaded this, all it did was sort of download the data and that's it. And then it was um, basically, you know, see you later that the, the data is downloaded and maybe that's all you want from it. And then you can go and put it in QGIS or the data load, load everything in manually and go from there. Um, but you might want to do, do something else with it. And um, uh, as, a, as a baseline, you might want to set preview equal to true, um, which is going to create that preview that we, we saw earlier. So that basically um, just gives us a, a really quick uh, uh, visualization of, of the data sources. So it, it plots them up. Um, I think if we if you want to dig into the, um, the source code, you can absolutely do that. And you can see just sort of how those plots are, um, plots are made under the hood. And I think it um, finds the the median or sorry, you know, like the minimum maximum and um, moves the data so it shows ninety five percent of it or something like that um, and throws the, the the label on it and so it's just to give you a good idea an idea that you know what you're downloading is what you expect um, so that's that and uh, we might see a couple of other other options um, yeah let's actually go into that so. I think at this stage, we are constantly trying to add more um, sort of more features and and documentation and everything. Um, and we'll we'll continue to expose that as uh, this project evolves. Um, at the moment, uh, understanding all the functionality, the, really the only way to do it is to read the source code, which is not not ideal, but um, geo data harvester. Um, Let's go in there. So I, I'm just in the, the Geodata Harvester um, uh, package here that I uh, think I linked before. It's, it's the link to it is scattered sort of throughout the um, throughout the notes. And um, and the, the the actual source data, it's the source files itself is in this source. And uh, if we just go and see, you know, something simple like the, the plotting function that that's actually in the, the utils um, directory and uh, you can see the, the plot rosters command there. And we can scroll down and we can, we can actually search for it. Plot rasters. So you can see kind of how it's uh, how it's made there. Oh, sorry, that wasn't actually the, the one I wanted to show you. But yeah, so that's the the. the code for, for plotting the rasters. So that's actually what's happening when you said that preview is true. Uh, what I wanted to actually show you was the uh, harvest inside the harvest module. And then inside this run, you can see, uh, yeah, so there's three optional commands here, the log name, preview, and whether it's going to return a data frame. And and so one and one compulsory, um, uh, one compulsory parameter there. And you can sort of read what each uh, what each thing does, and if you if you love Python, you can actually go down and see how it's implemented and, and everything like that. But at, at a high level, um, if you know the name of the function, then you can just go and see what the options are. Um, but as I said, we're we're trying to expose that and make it more user friendly, and um, so you don't have to dig into the weeds to to know um, that to get the preview of 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 the the harvest. You can just go preview equals true. Okay, sorry, there was a question in there. Um, okay, you just answered it, Genoa, good stuff. Oh, and Henry, everyone, and me as well at the same time. So, <laughs> so yeah, if you if you click on the little bug bug dude there, yeah. um, that will open up this little debugging thingy, which will show you stuff like what you'd be looking at when similar to what you'd see in the environment tab in the in an RStudio GUI. And so if you have declared any variables or loaded any objects into memory, they will show up in here. So my var equals one, run that. And sometimes it takes a little while to happen. 
Yeah, I tried that and it didn't work. That's why I, I didn't Oh, wanna, well, it works yeah. locally in Jupiter Lab normally. That's the thing, yeah. yeah. Maybe there's some issue with Nectar because yeah. um, this works on Jupiter Lab or in locally on your computer, which, by the way, I would recommend Jupiter Lab. It's, it's a really great way to use like an IDE for working with notebooks um, in Python code in general. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I don't know why it's not showing up in Nectar. Yeah, not sure. Uh, Maybe it's some setting that we need to enable for you guys. Python definitely doesn't have the, I guess the, you know, everyone uses R Studio, but in Python there's so many different IDEs and everything. Um, it doesn't have the 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 culture and ecosystem all 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 combined as well as R does. That's for sure. There's yeah, there's far more options though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's that's the uh, the trade offs, I suppose. Okay, so um, we've seen how we made a basic config file. We've seen how to sort of extend that config file um, and a few of the options in that running the harvest. Now we're going to um, add Google Earth Engine. So we haven't used this yet, and this is what we got everyone to um, sign up for. And so I've, I've kind of left this out to this point. Um, just, there's a few things that, that can go wrong. And um, so for all the other sources, they're all basically open access. Well, like publicly facing, um, whereas Google Earth Engine, you actually need to authenticate and say, yes, I'm, uh, here's my username and password um, in order to connect to the Google data um, repository. So if, if you've used any other data sources, you may have done that manually or something. Um, and, and obviously there's a lot of open uh, ones as well and kind of everything in between. Um, and so at the moment, yeah, that this, these are the ones that the data harvester uh, can utilize. But let's talk through this. So um, I, I, hopefully I'll get the experience uh, that everyone else does. But what we're going to do is run these couple of lines from EE Harvest Import Harvester and then harvester.initialize auth mode notebook. And we'll see, um, we're going to go through a series of steps. But basically, we just follow along um, what's on your screen and answer the questions. So I'll be doing it here. You can do it. Um, do it with me. I'll try to go at a, a reasonable pace, um, but hopefully the the answers should be should be okay. You can also see a preview of the process um, on that on the, the documentation page. Um, so this is part two of authorizing um, for work, workstation. So we're going to face all these uh, all these steps here. Basically, we're, we we log in with Google and um, create a new project um, via Google. So uh, let me go back and I will begin. Where am I? I'll begin the process. So I'm going to from e harvest import harvester and then harvester dot initialize. We'll see how we go. So I'll paste that and I'll click run. And it says to authorize access needed by Earth Engine, please open the following URL in a web browser and follow the instructions. All right, so let's do that. I'll open this up. So I just open it up in a new tab and, and now it says sign in. So I'm gonna um, sign in with my Google account. It's um, natbutter at gmail.com. Um, hopefully that's good. My password is there and I'll log in there. And I've got two-factor authentication enabled, so I've got my phone here, so I can um, so I can confirm that. So this experience might be a little bit different for you if you're already logged in. I'm in a private window, so it's asking me to do this. Um, yes, that was me. So I just authenticated um, on my phone. All right, and now it's redirecting me. Okay, so this is um, the page. Google Earth Engine is saying, hey, you've got uh, this thing asking for a token. How do you want to do this? Now, I already have a cloud project here. Yours probably looks similar. Um, if you don't have a cloud project, uh, you can create a new one. So if you create a new project, um, you can just click create new cloud project. I think the organization is none. You can call it uh some something whatever you like maybe something useful um ee workshop or so earth engine workshop or, or something um and then create a new project um i already have a project there so i can just use uh that one 
can also go and you know I have a bunch of um, Google Earth Engine projects um, already, so I can use those if I need to. Um, and then also the the data access, it, it, I mean, it would be fine if you didn't have use read only scopes, but it's basically a, a safety thing. So if the um, the Google if if the geodata harvester needed to write data to your um, folders within Google, um, then it, it would ne need that functionality, but we don't actually have that. So you can just go use read-only scopes and click generate token. And then we'll get a few more options. I think it'll ask me to log in again. Who do you want to, uh, which account do you want to use to, to authenticate? So I pick my account and uh, Google hasn't verified this app. So that's saying uh, it's not a Google app basically. Do, do you trust us as developers? that we're not doing anything funny. Um, so I click continue there. And then it says Google Earth Engine uh, wants access to your Google account. What do we want to give it access to? So firstly, we need it to access our Google Earth Engine data. Um, we also require access to just to view uh, Google Cloud Storage. I'm not sure why it needs that, but um, it doesn't work without it. So it is only um, read only though. So it can't change anything. Um, okay, make sure you trust this and I click continue. And then I'm going to get a token here. So this token is generated. Um, so basically I shouldn't show anyone this, but I'll, I'll revoke it after the, the course. This is basically like a, a username and password um, used to uh, interact between our notebook environment and also the um, uh, the geodata harvester and, and also the um, and Google Earth engine. So that's the thing that we need to copy. So I'm going to copy that. I'll go back here and it's ticking away saying, please enter my verification code. And that's what it is. So there's quite a few steps there. Press enter and it should work. So yeah, that, that token, it's basically like a, a, a very restricted username and password login. So it, it just allows um, uh, yeah, very finite access for the for us to connect to the Google Earth um, Engine repository and download data. That's basically all it allows. Um, so if anyone knows that token, they, they may be able to connect to the Google Earth Engine um, and download data under my account, which is okay at this stage. Um, okay, how'd everyone go? Hopefully you got the Earth Engine authenticated. I was expecting that to be another um, challenging step. So um, all is well, and that's fantastic, because uh, now we can add the entire Google Earth Engine um, uh, data sets that are available. And there are thousands, is that right, right Janwa? Like thousands of, of data sources? Six, and... 600 data sources. Oh, 600, that's all, okay. Not, yeah, not, but not that hundreds much. of thousands of data sets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. so it's, it's very, very thorough and um, it allows us to, to apply this sort of geodata harvester workflow. Um, and, you know, there's automated tools for, for interacting with the Google Earth Engine, but I guess, um, again, we, we just make it uh, a little bit easier and, um, and reproducible. That, that's the main goal. So I'm, I'm going to copy these last few lines. So we're adding the new lines to our results.basic. And I'll just check that. Uh, so I'll go back to my basic config YAML file. Start a new line down here, and I'll just clean up the, the syntax so it all looks nice. So there's our target sources. And then for Google Earth Engine, we have um, a bunch of these options, which we'll, we'll talk through in a minute. I'll save that file. And now let's let's run it. So um, I can either run that same line again. Maybe I'll, I'll, copy, um, I'll copy that so we get a sort of a new one. And I'll run the same thing again. And look, it says uh, Earth Engine has already been authenticated. So that's good because we authenticated up there. Um, and we're downloading. A, uh, yeah, I just explained that in the chat. Yeah. Do you know the answer? Yeah, I, I wasn't um, wasn't quite sure what that meant when I saw that 
Just yeah, there. sometimes pre-processing uh, removes the stack entry. So I think we should at some point save it and re-include okay. it. Yeah, because sometimes the stack is very useful. Just save the stack. I'm not. What's the stack? It's kind of like metadata. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So each of these different, you know, because all the data that we're getting here is all from the source, and each of the different, you know, there's a lot of information that's reported because, yeah, it's it's essential for our other things, but maybe not for everything. Yeah. All right. Yeah, but it's useful information. Yeah. Okay, and so we can see we've got all our data sources from before, and um, we have our uh, Earth Engine added there as well. Um, we've got two blank boxes, so you may have experienced that already. Uh, again, that's just a, a uh, need some some coding work to to remove extra boxes. It's just easier to make a, a regular grid than to um, an irregular grid that are waiting to be filled. Um, okay, and Ezra, you, you had a question about the ver verification code. So that that was the process we walked through. Um, basically, you have to start the initialization and then uh, uh yeah i actually did that it's part of the initialization but i didn't have the same process maybe because i'm already logged into google yeah, so yeah i that's haven't right. went to a step where i can get the verification code yeah so uh i think yeah th th this this can be tricky let me uh i think the best thing is probably to follow um this part authorizing so if you follow these notes, um, again, yeah, that, that might differ slightly depending on um, whether you're logged in or not. Um, and that, and hopefully that will sort of get to where you need to go. So it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of steps, but they're basically saying, here's my Google account, next, 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 next. That's, that's the crux of it. Um, and then you get the authorization code at the very end. And you have to take that back to your notebook and paste it in. I, I should point out, like you only have to do that once. So basically, if, um, once per computer. Or I'm doing this in a, a private window, um, so I, I, I have to do it because uh, there's nothing in the in the case or anything. Um, and also, we're on a, a remote repository, so it's the first time that that connection's been made. Um, so if you tried to, yeah, if you tried to connect again. Um, using a, a different computer or a different browser or something, you might have to do it again. But once you do it once, it's generally um, automated to do it multiple times. Okay, yeah, Ezra, if you can't follow those notes, um, yeah, just put your hand up in the chat again and, and someone should hopefully be able to, to put you in a um, breakout room or something. All right, so yeah, we're doing we're doing very well. Um, so we've added Google Earth Engine now. That, that's fantastic. Um, now we've we've just rerun it again, um, and we've we've previewed our, our data sources. All right, so now we have an exercise that that you can um, uh, try on your own. Let let's give everyone maybe five minutes. I'm going to be quiet, and what we have to do is that uh, you, you have to add the slope and aspect um, to, to your basic config file and, and run it again. See if you can add those to it. So you have to browse through. Uh, I haven't spoken about this, this section yet, but there, there's a whole, uh, uh, in the AgriFed um, workshop pages, there's a whole um, documentation on, uh, on the, the, the YAML file and, and kind of what options can go in there. And, and so on. So have a look through there and see how you might add the, um, what was the option? The uh, add slope and aspect both from the landscape collection. Okay. I'm going to mute myself and we can, um, I'll see if there's any volunteers that, that want to put their hand up. Otherwise, I'll talk.
All right, so Yen, while I see you're testing that waving thing, I'll show you how the way it works. What you need to do is you put your thumb up for long enough and then until it recognizes it and you see, and then it'll register it. Do you see a little, there should be a little circle where it's been like, oh, all right, I think you got a thumb, and then it'll register it. It potentially, it? and now I can see, nope. So it, what you'll see is at the bottom of your interface, you'll see a little thing when you do Oh, it. I see, I see the progress yeah. bar, okay, yeah. The progress bar, and then once it's logged, you're, you're ready to go. Ah, oh, there you go. It's coming. Okay. <laughs> that's that's too slow. <laughs> that takes too much time. Thanks, Henry. No worries. All righty, we're getting to end of our few minutes. How did uh, did everyone go? You may have seen me um, working away on the, the, the problem here. So what we had to do is basically just add an extra source um, to to this. And this is uh, the, the point of this exercise is to basically read the documentation and also just to practice uh, your muscle memory in um, in typing out the, the solution. So you, you could have obviously clicked the, the solution and seen that. Even that takes a little bit of um, effort. If you had gone to the um, the, the settings page, um, the, the YAML overview page as well, you can uh, scroll down and uh, read through some of the options here. And one of the um, the options is is this landscape. And you can see that the the um, the format's actually a little bit different to to what's in the solution. Um, uh, I I think that's just a, a a function of YAML's versatility, perhaps, or maybe the way we read it in Genoa or or Seb. Is is there any difference in the way we we set that up? No, that's no. fine. It will recognize both. Yeah. Assist. Yeah. So um, you might see them sort of written down uh, differently in different places. I think we've tried to be uh, consistent here, but you can sort of do it in as a list or sort of like a, a dashed um, physical list. And if you're watching me sort of work on, on it, um, you may have noticed I didn't put spaces here. So it is a bit um, demanding of, of how, we, um, uh, how we input things into the YAML file. So you have to make sure you get the, the, the syntax right. So when I ran that, I got um, I got some some weird error. I basically said the errors in Python normally start from the bottom, um, and it said something about the keys. So um, the, the the keys in this case were the, the the dictionary keys from the the YAML file, and so that I suspect that it was um, uh, due to to something in here being incorrect, and yeah, so basically missing those spaces there. Um, and then when it actually did work, I moved those spaces and could just run. And there we go. So we got it. And did that one pop? Oh, yep. So there's the, the relief 300, the slope, and the aspect. So those have all uh, populated now. Did anyone have any comments about, um, about that little, little challenge? Good stuff. Okay. Um, all right. So let, let's let's do do one more now. Uh, maybe maybe you ran ahead, but now uh, the challenge is to uh, download a different data source by referring to the Earth Engine data catalog. Uh, have a look at the different sections and tabs, and um, and then see if you can add um, one of these. Change the collection attribute in basic config. Um, so that looks like. Let's get the basic config. Uh, so we have a collection here, and we want to change uh, one to Landsat, Sentinel, Modus, and then run. So one of those, and then run the harvest um, function. All right, and yeah, if you want, you can 
you see what happens when you put put something in that doesn't exist. Um, we saw a mistake that I made earlier, you know, the, the kind of errors that you get. Uh, and, and and think about also with Google Google Earth Engine, um, you know, there's different attributes uh, that are required to the other data sources. And that's true. So, so all of these require um, uh, different data, uh, different sort of attributes. You can see silo, we have monthly grain, and then we have uh, this keyword sum. Um, and SLGA, we have bulk density, and then and also a keyword after that. So we have the data source, sorry, the data source, then the, the data, data layer, and then some sort of attribute around that. Um, and then some of these use the, the, the date sources and the target resolutions um, as a high level, which I think Google Earth Engine does as well. But then Google Earth Engine also has kind of these, these extra options. So um, yeah, we're trying to balance kind of the complexity versus the um, uh the the functionality all right so but but he, here's me monologuing again uh i'll be quiet whilst i'll, I'll work on this and, and give you a moment to to try it out as well or maybe i'll keep talking as i um, just browse some of these options in um on google earth engine Oh, that's an interesting insight, um, George. Very interesting. That could be that could be a, a, a bug. Um, yeah, yeah. That 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 actually makes sense. So, um, yeah, you would have changed the bounding box. It would have said, "Hey, this data already exists." But I think Google Earth Engine actually kind of like recomputes, so it it, it might override it, whereas the other ones um, won't. Well done. Good, good bug finding, troubleshooting, and resolving. So, So if you're following uh, what I'm doing, you can see I probably made a typo or something. Let's try and resolve that. Um, so if I edit this line, using the, the solution that's in there, um, and put that back in my basic config and make a typo. Ah. I did. Run that again. And then it downloads. So yeah, a lot of this, uh, I think, um, you get familiar with the the availability of um, data sets, um, but it also just requires clicking through, finding. Uh, Know what you need um finding the the name of the collection which is buried in the the google earth um engine library and then also um sort of the, the options that are available um so the bands and everything like that 
Okay, so there I've got my new um new image there. Okay, so how did everyone go with that one? Do Jen, why do you do you want to add anything else about the um Google Earth Engine? This is definitely your domain, never <laughs> mine. Uh, yes, I mean there's 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 quite a lot to unpack uh, from uh, the Google Earth Engine. So um, I think it's best to if you really want to know more about it is to look at uh, the GitHub, I guess web page, uh, GitHub site for this particular project. So I've just pasted that link on on uh, on chat. So lots of functionality there that we 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 obviously do not have time to cover. Right, so uh, on top of uh, cloud masking, uh, the there's also spectral index, uh, spectral indices. So uh, many of us use spec, uh, use uh, spectral bands to calculate uh, indexes for specific <clears throat> observations. We've actually plugged into this uh, thing called awesome spectral indices to automatically compute uh, basically every single published or previously published spectral index. So you can also have a look at that. Yeah, but yeah try, try it out. See if you can um, plug in things that make sense uh, to you. Yeah, I'm definitely yeah. no expert with, with a lot of these data sources. So um, yeah. All right, and there's a question. Do Donald, are you- Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, just just a couple of very quick questions on this. I tried I tried using an evapotranspiration layer where the available band was something other than NDVI. Uh, and I tried overwriting both NDVI and whatever the other in, in both locations, and it didn't like it. Um, is that the kind of thing that the e harvest documentation will explain to me? Genoa, do you know the answer to this? Uh, I have to apologize. I, I was typing out a troubleshooting, so I was troubleshooting with someone else. Oh, sorry. I wasn't listening. So so I, I I just I just took a look at uh, um, an Earth Engine layer on evapotranspiration where the only band was ETA. So yep. I tried replacing both spectral and bands with ETA, um, and got errors out of that saying it wasn't okay. an appropriate thing. So it, it, if I read the harvest documentation, will it take me through all of that stuff? Yeah, I mean, if it's not a band that if it's a band that's already present in the collection itself, you don't have to specify in spectral. You just download that band. So you don't okay. have to compute any spectral in the index for oh, that. Oh, okay. So I can just comment yeah. that one out because I tried commenting out mask clouds and it got upset because that was required and as a, one way or the other and things like that. And and if I wanted to yeah. have multiple collections, do I repeat the pre-process line or? That's the, that's actually a very common question. Um, yes, it's it's what you should be doing, but it's it's, it's a functionality that hasn't been, um, I guess, activate it so it's it's in, it's in one of our branches um right. I'm, I'm still testing it because but once you include multiple collections there's a lot of multiple options that can or cannot be used so mm -hmm. lots of validation steps there but okay. yes at, at some point you can do that i think right now what it does is that if you put a whole list of different sources that will just pick the last one just so okay. that you get right. something out of it yeah okay all right thanks very much yeah good to know okay uh any other questions now that we've reached the end of um, this session and sort of unpack what what how that uh, settings file really works and um, you know how we can sort of extend it and add more options and configure things. Is everyone happy? Good stuff. Um, so. Uh, okay, sorry, there was one question. Uh, yes, so basically you can only have one collection from Google Earth Engine at a time per harvest. Is that, that in summary, Genoa? Uh, for now, yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'll click through to the, the se session number uh, three. And what time is it? We're, we're making good time. Um, we'll have a break uh, in, a, in a, shortly. I'll just sort of introduce um, what we're going to do here. So in, in this one, um, this we're going to unpack kind of what's happening under the hood, just so you can get an idea of uh, functionality and, and options. And if you are a, more of a, I guess, a Python power user, you can start to extend the, the, um, the data harvester 
and see what's actually happening in that harvest disk, that harvest.run script. So it, it's just running through and kind of automating a, a lot of steps for you. Um, but you can kind of take out pieces of that and and um, and and just look at it and go into detail on each of the data sources. So that's what we'll we'll do here. Um, and let's start. And the the other thing we're going to do is look at um, how we have these interactive widgets to kind of build our own settings file, and that's quite powerful now because it's probably the um, it's probably the easiest way to to see what data sources are available without um, trawling through various documentations and everything. You need to kind of open up the the um, the widgets and you can see what options are available to you and um, this way you don't have to remember anything that's in a, a the, the yaml file so what time is it uh yeah let's uh think how long this will take yeah okay let's, let's do this so um i'm going to import all these libraries so this is what happens under the hood uh when we run the harvest function we're importing a a bunch of standard um uh just python libraries so um things for dealing with like path names um pandas if you're familiar with pandas and, and matplotlib plotting things um so nothing too extraordinary uh and then we we also import uh the D geo data harvester um we import that e harvest uh, package again and then also just to make things a bit simpler, we uh, import a, a couple of the sub modules and functions within the Geo Data Harvester um, uh, package as well. So I can copy that whole uh, script. I'll close my basic config. I think we're um, finished with that one at the moment. Um, I'll close my untitled, um, and I might actually just start a new. Um, I'll start a new notebook for this one. Can even rename it so I know where I'm going. Uh, rename. How do I do that? Rename session three. I'll just get myself all set up, um, and I'm just going to paste all those imports in, um, and we'll, we'll talk through what some of these things are doing as we get to them. So I'll, I'll run that. Nothing should happen. You can see the little star there, mean, meaning it's running. You can see uh and, and now it's gone so that means that it has finished running so hopefully everything worked um we didn't get any errors which is good and uh 11 20 i'll just talk through the widgets and then we'll have a have a break in about five minutes so this next one um we're going to uh yeah build our own widget file here so let's copy this over and see what happens. Now, the the syntax here. Let me um, let me talk about it. Um, the Python syntax here is, is basically you run this command hw.gen main tab, and hw was one of the little functions that we imported from um, the data harvester. So we're just running this function here, and that function returns these four different. Um, variables and one of those variables we can uh we can sort of activate using this display thing so this is a very i guess yeah it's a very non almost yeah almost non python way to to do things but it's because we want this interactive um ability and so if i run that you'll see what i'm talking about after a second or two it comes up and um we have these options so that's a very kind of user friendly um, uh, interface here and we can set our input and output specifications so hopefully most of this is self-explanatory uh, for instance the input file we can select that and uh, navigate to to what would be basically a, a list of latitudes and longitudes so that's our kind of area of interest um, that the the geodata harvester uses and for that, I was in the um, AgriFed workshop data and then uh, the example site, uh, lara.csv. So if I select that, you can see that it's uh, selected. And, and keep in mind that wasn't the, I think there's another data folder probably in your um, 
your top level directory. It's not that one. It's the one inside the AgriFed data workshop example site. Okay. Good stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the output path, again, this is relative to where we're executing our code. So we, we can call this, um, uh, you know, maybe session um, three results. And um, if I press enter, I don't think anything will happen, but it should, that should um, populate for us. And now we can start to set our settings for spatial and temporal um, stuff. So uh, longitude and latitude, we're still using the same um, bounding box as before. And because I obviously can't remember it, I'll, I'll just, um, we can go into AgriFed and I'll, I'll use the, the settings file as a, as a template, basically. So I'm just going to scale those, that bounding box. Um, you can probably change it up, though, if you, if you wish. So let's maybe make it make it a bit bigger, shall we? One, so that's left. So let's go one, four. Let's make it a full degree or so bigger. Or is that too much? Do you think that might be too much? Maybe one, four, nine point six. Yeah, there we go. So we just made it a little bit bigger. Uh, the date is in days, months, years. Um, so let's maybe do 2021. So 01. Um, and we could do 10, 2021. We could do maybe 30, 10, 2021. Uh, now yours probably looks nicer than mine, but might just zoom out for a second, see if I get it. Oh, yeah. So this is the. Um, Spatial resolution, uh, which we had set to six in the, the file, but you can uh, change that as needed. And the number of um, temporal and uh, number of temporal time steps and the temporal buffer, uh, which is uh, something that, that some of the data sources may use for, um, for averaging and, and um, combining them. So I think we've just got one and one at the moment, which is probably fine. Uh, okay, and, and then now we get into the, the fun stuff. So that was kind of the, the a bit tedious just to kind of select these things. Um, but if you know what you're doing, you kind of you do it once and that's it. And to download um, options from SLGA, you kind of see all the options available. So this is the first time I think we've seen kind of this before. And um, and and so on with all the other um, the data sets, and you can see, you know, there's quite a lot there. So there's no way that you can possibly remember it and know exactly um, what each of the layers is called without um, some sort of documentation like this. Okay, so I might just uh, pause here. So you might you might want to play around with that on the break or something. Um, but we'll come back and we'll pick back up, and we'll finish selecting all our uh, all our widgets and options, and then we will. Um, then we'll run it and we'll, we'll step through things um, progressively. Okay, so let's have another 10 minute break um, for now. So I will um, turn off my video and uh, audio and everyone should go and have a walk around and we'll come back um, at 11.36. All right, see you soon.
Hello, everyone. I've lost track of time there. I was having a snack. Okay. Hour of power here. So let's get stuck back into things. Were there any questions at this point? Or we're all happy to forge into the, the widgets and the, the low level Python code? And this is a reminder to everybody here, um, all of this material is all online. So uh, you can go through it at your own pace as well later. Um, I think Yanwar, Nate, and Seth did a really great job putting together a bunch of documentation. And there will be um, more to look forward to as well in the future. Yeah, that's right. With the, these notes shouldn't uh, shouldn't go anywhere. We'll we'll continue sort of refining them and updating them as we uh, change make any changes to the the geodata harvester as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully it should be long lived. Okay, so we were looking at the uh, the widgets, um, a way to kind of manually generate these um, uh, these settings files. So uh, we, we imported a, a whole bunch of libraries that we're going to use um, for some of these are for the widgets and, and others are, are for things we're going to do further on. Um, we set our input and output specifications. I missed uh, two columns over here because I had I was zoomed out too much. Um, one of the options is the header name of the, the longitude and one of the, the latitude. And, and, and so that basically means we expect the data input to look like this the example file there, basically a latitude column and a longitude column. Um, I think it can be it can be any CSV or uh, data frame style um, uh, file. But and it might have a different name, maybe like northings or eastings or or x and y or something, um, and and that will be the coordinates that are uh, a used. So um, it will pick out the name of them. So that's what we require. Um, and so in this case, what what are they called? Lat and long are the header files. So um, close that again. Get back my screen real estate. Long and Flat. All right, good stuff. And um, next we can do some SLGA data selection. Now, yeah, there's lots of options here and we definitely haven't tested sort of everything. So if you find something that doesn't work, um, it could be because, you know, the widget doesn't quite match up with what the API is expecting um, and that combination of thing, thing doesn't exist um, or it could be, could be something else. Um, so please, you know, if you find an issue, log, log it on the GitHub and we can, um, we can fix things up, but let's, um, just try and replicate what we have in here. So we have SLGA, uh, bulk density of zero to five centimeters and the clay at zero to five centimeters. So this is looking at sort of soil data. Um, and I think their, their data sources provided, um, the, the measure, these measurements at different depth layers. So we'll go uh, zero to five um, centimeters. And we also had uh, clay at um, zero to five. So we've got those, those two there. I think it might uh, default to zero to five and maybe select a different one. And you can go from there. Or we can even mix it up. We'll go five to 15. Let's do that. Um, silo, again, there's all these different options. Um, so you can pick, pick a couple of those, maybe um, in the max temp, min temp, you can pick these, these first few, uh, the daily rain, you know, it's mean, median, uh, our options here for kind of temporal, uh, sorry, um, yeah, temporal processing uh, in, for this data set, it, it may not make sense for all of them, like to take a, um, uh, take the, the max of the max temp, M maybe it m makes sense. Um, um, or maybe not, but maybe we want the, the mean of it or the median. Yeah, it kind of depends on what the data set looks like, um, but those options are available. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, so what do we have actually in here? So the mean, median, and the sum. So I'll, I'll kind of replicate that. Um, so mean, median, median, and the sum for the monthly rain. All right, and uh, we might just leave it at that for now. So we've got a few um, 
uh, data sources. And so I will um, get a new um, file there. And the next step is basically to uh, take those settings and put them into something that Python can understand. So at the moment, they're just kind of sitting in, in that widget selection. And so here's a very complicated code block, um, but basically all it's doing is saying, uh, if you've got settings that are being selected there, then let's um, let's start, let's activate those settings. So let's create a file called settings underscore saved. Let's um, create the output directories that, that you've specified. Um, and let's put them all into a into a Python object so we we can uh, then use those settings um, in in the next steps. Uh, so I'll, I'll just copy that code block and paste it in here, and we'll see if it works. Basically, so look at that. It uh, it appears to have worked. Um, it says the settings file saved to session three underscore result settings saved dot yaml. Um, that's the in file. That's the out path, and these are all the options we selected. So we haven't um, picked any any of those. Um, oh, and it looks like um, Google Earth actually had a, a, some defaults in there. And if I open this, my file explorer up again, I can uh, see I now have this session three underscore results folder. Um, it's got my YAML file ready to be shared with other people um, or executed and run. Um, and so, now we could run that harvest.run function and, and that should just work. Or we can, um, but what we're actually gonna do is um, build build it out. But let's just open it up um, just to prove ourselves right. So if I open up this set, set um, this file we've created, you can see it, it's a nice little um, template for um, what a settings file might look like. So you can build these up um, quite, quite easily using that little widget syntax. Okay, um, and anything else? Oh, and the, the other thing, you can also just load in the settings file as well. So you can uh, select the file uh, and, and load load one in and then run this. This is basically checking whether um, we're gonna load one in or, or read the values from the, the new settings. So that's what that does. Are there any questions around those kind of options and everything? There's, as you can see, there's, so many different uh, layers and everything to, to pick from. Um, and yeah, some of the, like, not everything's exposed also in the, the, the widgets, um, uh, especially with the Google Earth Engine layers. So that there's so many different layers in Google Earth Engine that there's, there's only a handful there, but you can then, um, you can add others. The same for respect and it's just selection, it's just a, short pre-selection of some of the main important ones, but there right. are like, I think hundreds or so actually in total available. Okay, yeah, good good to know. Okay, so yeah, now, now we have our file. Um, uh, I've also mentioned uh, you can just load in a, a, a file directly. If you already have a YAML file, um, you can load it in uh, using the, the hw.load settings um, function. And that, that's a quick way to get stuff in as well. Um, I suppose the only time you'd want to do that is if you want to then use those things uh, in a manual process rather than just running it in the, um, the harvest.run function. But the harvest.run function under the hood uses uh, these kinds of functions and, and builds from there. So uh, the first thing we can do, uh, I might just, um, yeah, just copy and paste here. Um, so I'm just going to copy setting up our data frame of interest. And we've already seen a lot of this, um, but this is what's happening in that harvest.run function. We, we read this file that's in the settings.in file, which is this one here. Um, and it gets assigned to a data frame. Then we pull out the longitude and the latitude uh, using those column names that we specified and it turns it into a um, uh, a geo data frame so um, and and that's kind of what a lot of the, the functionality builds around this 
Okay, so that's the first step that happens in the harvest.run function and in um in in our automation here. Uh, the next thing we just do a, a little processing to find um, to convert from our arc second resolution to um, to get some numbers out, which I think we use later on for um, to, to convert basically degrees to, to to meters. So I can run that, and you can see the result. You can see. Uh, what our bounding box was, uh, six arc second resolution. Python sometimes has weird sort of rounding uh, issues. So it's uh, turned basically an integer into a float and added a, a very, very small um, uh, a value there. And it's telling us um, what the equivalent of um, the resolution will be in, in latitude. All right, okay, so what's next? So, so um at any point as well uh we can kind of get some some help about a function um so if you know the name of um one of our things gh even that'll work oh yeah so so doing a question mark this is a a function of um of the uh jupyter environment so an ipython notebook environment um, doing question mark syntax and then the name of, in this case, we've set a module, which is the, the geodata harvester. And it just gives us a little bit of information about it. It says, oh yeah, here's the um, here's where you should go to, to find out more about this. Um, if you open up a specific, specific module within the geodata harvester, um, uh, you can get some more information. So gh.harvest um, can tell you about it. Um, get data so we have a whole bunch of these get data um, functions so get data dea that's one of them and this is the documentation's being fleshed out a lot here um so you can read all about like what's in this uh data source where it comes from and uh so on and so forth so th there's a, a kind of a quick way to get access to to a little bit of information if you didn't know that um, it's basically reading from the the source files. So rather than going onto the GitHub repo and clicking through, you can um, have a quick look um, to to read some documentation like that. And now the next step is we're going to start a log file. So we have these log files to sort of keep track of everything that that's happening because we're going to different data sources, and then from each data source, we're pulling out different data layers, and then each data layer is kind of like different options associated with that. We need to keep track of all these um, different data layers so we know um, kind of what's happening. Uh, so we're going to create just a, a, a session to log that. So df underscore init log table, and that's it. Um, you can have a look at that log if you want. It should be empty now, but basically it's waiting to be filled up with the layer names, the aggregation function, uh, the data set, the layer title, uh, and what the file name is and, and some other information. Um, okay, and all right, now let's get to something exciting here. This is where, this is our first, um, I guess, function where we actually, um, uh, the harvester reaches out to, to a data source and downloads something. So um, I'll copy the SLGA download link and I'm gonna, put it in here and I'll, I'll run that and you can see so now it seems to be working which is great so we, we set up that yaml file and uh, now it's working behaving the same as before um, and it gives us some some info about the different layers that we've got so um, and just unpacking this a bit I, again if, if you're comfortable with python then um, you by all means can kind of dig into this sort of stuff. Um, otherwise you can just use that harvest function to kind of automate everything. Um, uh, but just talking about like how it's getting this, uh, how, how it's kind of getting the values out. Um, the first line here, it wants the minimum depth and the maximum depth, and that refers to these um, the the layers specifically in this um, in the SLGA data sets that has have the different depth layers for each of the data. 
um, sources. And so it reaches into uh, the target source. Let me let me completely unpack this. So if I go something like this, settings, target sources, SLGA, and just uh, show that, it shows me bulk density, 0 to 5 centimeters clay, 5 to 15 centimeters. And if I um, pull out the, the, the values of that, so saying, give me the values of each of these things, um, you'll see that it returns 0 to 5 and 5 to 15. And uh, in this case, I, I've, I've just said, give me the, the first one. This could be a, um, just noticing a um, slight little uh, bug there, but um, we, I could talk through that in a second, sorry. So um, yeah, so, so all we're doing is unpacking these numbers so that we can use them in the function that we call out. And again, it's like, a confusing line to, to pull out um, in order just to get a, a value, which is zero and five, um, which we're going to pass to the function, because that's what it requires when we make the API call uh, to the SLG da data source. It says, hey, you have to give me the depth minimum and you have to give me the depth maximum. I need those numbers. Um, and there's multiple different ways that we could give get that value. Uh, but this is just sort of one, one way to do that. We could also hard code it uh, in this. But we're, we're kind of reaching into that settings file, and this is how it's done in the um, in the harvester function. Um, and then again, also we need specifically what layers. So um, we, as we saw, it's the same thing. We're just getting the the list of um, the list of layer names here. So here we picked out the values, which are the the depth layers, and then the keys are bulk. Excuse me, uh, bulk density and clay which in this case are our layers. And so we need that. Okay, so that, that sets us up with kind of the data set, uh, the uh, parameters that we're, we're, we're gonna require. And then we actually make the function call. So here we actually make the function call uh, to this get data SLGA module. And within that, we use a function called get SLGA layers. And uh, we pass it those two layer names, bulk density and clay. We also pass the settings.target box, which uh, is just that, that bounding box that we're familiar with. We also pass it the uh, settings.out path. So it wants to know where, where is it going to save it to, which is session three results. Um, we now have a depth min value, a depth max value, and uh, get CI, I forget what get CI is, but that's prob probably the default anyway. Um, but that's, yeah, that's particular for the SLGA because because it also offers confidence intervals. Um, oh, confidence already interval. On, yeah, on confidence the, interval. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so, so that's basically the, the syntax of most of um, these data sources. You give it the, the name of the, the layer that you need from the data source. You give it the bounding box. You give it where to save it. And then you'll have a whole bunch of optional things that might be specific to that data source. Um, but as we can see, we've, um, we've, we've downloaded that and it's returned this, this thing here, F names out SLGA, which is basically the, the file names that it's saved. So it's downloaded two different file names. Um, and a, you, you might see that the, the bug that I noticed, I, I've specified one to five centimeters, but up here where the, the min and max is only defined, basically it has to be the same for each one. So um, yeah, I'll have to look into see, see if that's the case for um, the harvest function as well. Um, okay, so so we return that the the file names, which they should now exist in here. Yep, there they are. Um, so they've been downloaded, and yeah, the con confidence intervals have been downloaded as well. So we've got kind of um, six files there that have been downloaded, and um, now the next thing we do, which is uh, is to add that information to the log file. So I'll copy that next cell and I'll run that. And you can see now our log file gets filled with um, sort of these information, this information here. Um, and 
the the log file can be confusing as well to update it because it requires uh, everything you've done in a specific format. Um, but basically, we we say update the log log table. We already had a log table called DF log. Um, give it the file names. Give it the the layer names. Uh, give it the data source and tell us the what settings you're using so it, it reaches into that settings file and um, then there's some other options there as well and that's basically what we have to do for each data layer and just a reminder this all happens you know in the harvest function so you don't need to know this unless you want to uh, ju just use this um, so if you only use one data source maybe it makes sense for you to to kind of um, use this really fast API functionality. So you can manually type in um, whatever you need. Uh, sorry, you manually type in whatever you need for the uh, get SLGA layers. So that's uh, that's an option for you. All right, and then, um, yeah, basically the same kind of thing happens. Uh, so for silo, you know, we set up the different kind of the slightly we tweak the options a little bit so there's a, some weird python that pulls it out um and because the the data that's returned is is slightly different to the the, the slga that we did in the first step um we have to deal with that in a different way so you can see kind of how that works um by looking at the code there or you can just run it and and trust that that it's doing what it's supposed to do um but that's the beauty also of um you know things like the log file you can kind of check and you can see that mistake that's it says five to 15 centimeters but then the the file name is actually zero to five um okay and it's downloaded those and um we update the log as well in a second so these these ones are pretty pretty hefty files all right, and you can see that they've um, all been downloaded, the log's been updated, and we should see, which I think, oh yeah, whoops, there should be a uh, a slash there, I think, otherwise it's it's created a new folder for that one. Uh, sorry, was someone asking a question? Sorry, that was just me making a noise, making a sound. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, just, I was just like, uh, what? It's very quick. The downloads are super fast. It takes three minutes on my computer in, in Sydney Uni. So the servers are extremely fast. Yeah, that's good. We're all downloading. Like Silo is the slowest because they're the biggest um biggest files, I guess, uh, I think. And generally the slowest, but that is good. They're very robust. Yeah, and, and some of these, sometimes they go offline. I think there's one data set that goes down for like over lunchtime, two days a week. Uh, every single week so um, it, but hopefully the, the harvester can kind of deal with that and go like oh hey it's down at the moment check this check that and, and we'll give you some feedback um, so we, we might get lucky and, and something will be down uh, okay and, and so there's some simple processing as well that um, that we're slowly exposing uh, within the the sort of automated processing um, but it, it does exist also under the hood if, if you um, Want to dig into the weeds but there is um yeah in this case if we're interested in the um what have we just downloaded we've downloaded the, the silo uh data sets and you might be um is that right sorry um yeah you, you might want to do some uh simple processing on it so we can um it, in this case take like the, the the mean of the the files so that they're, they're um sort of uh they, i think there's day, daily um information and we want to collapse that all into like a, a single flat file um in some way so we take them the, in, in this case we're going to look at the the average minimum and the average um maximum or, or the mean min and mean max um and so we get one sort of single um file that we can uh Oh, sorry, no, in this case, we're, we're taking the average between the, the minimum and the maximum. So we're taking those two files that are being downloaded and we're, we're combining them together into one. So we just get the, the, the mean of those two. So th yeah, there's a few, quite a few different um, variations that you can take. So, so I, I was talking about uh, if there's sort of daily stuff in, in a single file, uh, we can collapse that all down into 
into one, um, or if you have multiple files and you want to um, combine them together into, into one, there's these processing functions um, as well that, that can, can be added. So I'll just uh, copy that in. Again, it is some like weird, you know, Python stuff. So in this case, um, it, it pulls, there's a, like a fancy way of pulling out just the, the, the file names that we want to combine and then, um, and then we, we say what aggregation method. So we have, um, if I run this, we'll see the aggregation method. It says finding the mean out of possible, you can either do the mean, the median, the sum, the 95 percentile, the fifth percentile, um, and it's saving it out to a new file. And so there's where we actually run the aggregation function. Um, so there's options for that. And, uh, and then again, some, some weird stuff to add it to the log files. Um, but as I mentioned, we're kind of like adding this uh, aut automated to the uh, the harvest function. Okay, so yeah, we've got a bunch of things in there. So we're slowly building up um, this this big data cube, I suppose we would call it, um, of different files. And we can just I'll speed things up a bit. I'll download a couple more. So the DEA, um, it's quite a big one. You can sort of read through again. It's the same syntax uh, just with slightly different tweaks depending on the data source um, again getting it into the right uh, the right format um, it's my running and um, and I have no I've commented out the make sure it's doing what it's doing um, so we go. Um, you're getting into the right syntax and um, and putting it into the, the where we need it to be, either in the, the list of layers or the um, or the uh, add it to the data. Now, wait, I don't think that one downloaded. Let me just try that again. What have I done wrong? Um, no, it didn't appear to to debate. Um, did it? Maybe I'm missing something. Okay, that's okay. I'll I'll um I'll move on. So again, um, the the DEM. Let me try that one. See if that works. If that one didn't, um, run that one. would expect some sort of output um, and okay. Hold on. why aren't you running? Is it running? Am I the only one having this problem? Get data, let me just try and run this. Oh, I know why, because um, I, I was, I, I didn't set these up. So uh, back back in our um, settings file, the, there's there's no options for the DEM, um, DEA, radiometric landscape. So I haven't actually set those. Um, so if I had set them, then then I could have done this, but they're not there. So that, that's uh, that's expected behavior. It's basically saying, yep, there's no DEM. Good stuff. I'm not doing anything. So it's working as as expected. Um, so I'll skip that and I'll just kind of, um, I'll go down to, uh, the, I'll do, um, Google earth engine cause that one should be working. So I'll initialize and should hopefully say, yeah, it's authenticated. Um, I will run again it's the same kind of syntax um it's just using e harvest and then it, it, we we pass it various things from the settings files um and it, it does the processing and, and downloads and then uh oh, sorry it sets up the processing first so google google earth engines um interesting because it actually does all the processing on the server for you um but tiff is not defined so i've made a mistake here tiff this. No um, 
I think I know what the problem is. Uh, we that's an old old code block. Um, we oh, no yeah, longer yeah. have our format. Okay. Our path and scale. I think we've removed all those three. I Let's think. Let's give it a go. Yeah. Um, no, that's fine. Remember, I, I didn't set Google Earth Engine up, so maybe. Um... But yeah, the Google Earth Engine settings is mostly blank, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's no just... bands to download. No yeah, I was just hoping that it worked, but um, uh, how about I do this? I can go, I think I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to go to kernel. I'm going to restart my kernel. I'm going to load a settings file. Oh, sorry. First of all, I'll import my modules and I'm going to rerun that. And I'm going to show you the power of uh, the reproducibility. I'm going to load a settings file. Um, I've got one I prepared earlier. So in the data and in session three. And then I run this and we can see it's loaded all these settings. And I should be able to um, make quick work of kind of rerunning um, everything. There we go. That was. Uh, What's down? Oh yeah. So now, now we're moving. Did I run? There we go. So it's uh, back, back downloading the the silo data. But yeah. So because I uh, was lazy, I guess at the start and didn't set up all my widgets, um, uh, I kind of got uh, I sidetracked from the notes a bit, and there was uh, a bunch of details missing that that were required if I wanted to keep going through the notes. Um, so just reuse it, just using a uh, a default settings file and loading it in, I, I can now um, very quickly reproduce what was in that settings file to where I'm up to. Uh, I can reinitialize my notebook. Should be fast. And, uh, set up that, and then I'll um, think. Let's see, is that? Oh, let me because I made some changes in there. Let me um, just copy that back over. If it's not fine. Uh, okay, I'm not sure. That was the mistake I actually ran into last night and I thought I fixed it by... Yeah, just remove out format. Um, okay. That option should work. Oh, genius. I think it's that. Okay, so that's downloading. And I think that was that's the last of the downloads. And um, is that right? Last the downloads, it adds it automatically to the log file, and we should get a big log out. And then finally, um, and that's finished. Oh, that's right. I, I, there we go. Okay, just got that stack entry. Good stuff. Look how look how many layers we've got. So we've just sort of downloaded multiple layers. There's lots um, from the the Landsat imagery. I think there. Um, so we've got thirty nine spatial layers. I can save the log out. Uh, so there's no log file found. That's good. Um, so it saved it out. So if I now need to, um, I don't know, if I restart my Python session, I don't have to download everything again. I can just read in that log file really quickly and um, and, and sort of do any any other processing from there. And so the last couple steps um, are to pull out those um, points of interest. So uh, there's an extension to, the, to this project, which was sort of all about data aggregation, pulling it in, and that is doing a machine learning component. And so um, required for that, I guess, is to um, is, is to have a value at a whole bunch of different locations um, for every single layer. So for all 39 layers, we've got all these points of interest, and we want um, for each of those points, uh, we want those 39, the 39 layer values um, for every single point. And so that's what we can... Uh, we can do there we using that that raster input uh, we can look at the so gdf is our um is our geo data frame and so basically we've um got a value up here for every single one of those layers and you can see the the value that um has been determined 
at a point of interest. So that's good. And um, and then finally, yeah, we can, we can save that out and we, we can also um, make a plot. I'll do the plot first. So this is that same yeah, plot, plotting function that we saw earlier. So you can see all the different layers. Um, and here you can see where the, the temporal aspect comes into it. Like uh, this, a, a lot of these are, are missing values. And then, okay, so in December here, it looks like, oh, sorry, no, on the 12th day of October, um, there was a flyover. So we have data for that day, but then all the other days there is none. Um, so our temporal processing can kind of deal with that and say like, oh yeah, take the, the, the maximum or the median of um, all the ones in that time range. Um, but we haven't done that for, for this step, but the, the quick preview allows you to kind of determine that you need to do that. Okay. And yeah, finally, and you can also save it out as a, uh, as a CSV or whatever file. Uh, and so if I go to my output folder, which is, I think it is output actually. Wait, where have I saved it? session results session settings outpath results dot csv so i think it's output um oh sorry results dot g g p k g yeah here we go so i have a geo package um for my output there and uh i also have the the um results dot csv so two different file formats and you can go and then take that csv into whatever um your favorite post-processing package might be or, or downstream analysis. Um, all righty. And so that is uh, basically it for what we wanted to kind of get through today. Um, I think I have a couple more notes. Um, so yeah, this last session, I think is it, it obviously it can, it can get quite complicated if you're really comfortable with python then um, by all means it it shows you it, it exposes kind of what, what's happening and how those api calls are made um and the options available to you um if you're less comfortable and you just want to use this as, as a tool um or even if you just want to use it as a tool you can um just use that harvest run function like we saw in the first two sessions and how to extend the, the settings file and so that settings file is the real driver of everything that's happening here um, as time goes on, you know, we're, we're trying to make things as, um, as simple as possible and exposing a lot more functionality and, uh, and, and usability as well. So please, um, you know, if you, if you have an automated workflow that, that kind of you think would make sense, um, for this, then I, I, I'd encourage you to submit like a feature request saying like, here, I want to do this and then take these processing steps and, 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 um, and, and so I get these data sets at the end, um, cause we're always looking for kind of use cases, uh, to, to build out the, the functionality and expose, um, options. And if you're finding bugs, put an issue up, chances are we may have seen that bug already. And it's just a matter of time, whether we, we get around to it and deal with a lot of edge cases. Now, um, that's basically everything from me. Uh, I'll mention the, we have a feedback survey, but um, Seb, did you want to have any extra remarks around everything? Um, yeah, one remark is, I'm just getting um, pointed out that RDC um, has some limited um, space on the on a JupyterLib service given the workshop and we have all these participants and a lot of data. So they will uh, delete the uh, current user space that's just used for the workspace uh, after the sessions um, to make some space available. Um, so yeah, if you log in tomorrow, you might not be able to see that. Uh, you, you still have access, uh, but some of the files might have been disappeared um, under that you've just downloaded. And uh, we had some previous um, maybe requests to talk a bit more about uh, or what like um, if you would like to add some some new data sources. Um, like currently we have like landscape data, silo, um, Google Earth Engine, and all the other layers that we mentioned. Um, so um, there's a possible sort of geodata harvest that's designed to be modular and extensive in that way. And one could use those get data underscore um, Python files or modules 
um, as templates. Um, so basically you can build your own uh, data source module based on those ones. A lot of those um, models um, have basically kind of free components. There's a lot of other functions in there, just wrapper functions around the basic um, download function. Um, but free components is obviously the, uh, one is the uh, download function that takes in like the bounding box, um, uh, the, the uh, min and uh, max uh, date and a couple of other options. And we have typically a dictionary uh, included in those in, in one of those files. Uh, maybe you open the get data radio metric. Well, that, I think it's an easy one. Um, dictionary that, that allows us a bit more to extract uh, what are the available data layers um, and, and some more options and attribute and license schemes. So it's possible to automatically create like an um, pretty more like automatically um, have available all the metadata and licensing. And uh, for the couple of options, um, depending on what kind of API um, the, the data source based on, um, here we often leverage uh, web map server APIs like web coverage sy uh, systems or web map servers um, that allow um, basically to also do the uh, processing on, on the server. Like for instance, uh, you can take into account the bounding box uh, descriptions and resolutions already. And there are also other APIs like REST APIs and uh, like Silo, for instance, is based on the, um, uh, like it's just an AWS bucket. Um, so depending on the, on, on the API specifics, um, you would have to know a little bit about obviously how to, how to get those requests done. Um, like we have, um, and then the construct basically um, one of those files similar to this, to this template files. Um, that, that's usually a good spot to start with. Um, and, and then you could call this um, file. Um, so if you fork, for instance, the repo on your, on your local environment and your local uh, machine, uh, you could add one of those uh, new modules if you find one. Uh, it can be much simpler. It can be also just a simple REST API request. And, and include this in your Jupyter notebook, similar to what, what Nate was just talking through uh, uh, as a function, uh, calling a function, and then include it as a, um, in the log files as well to do spatial temporal processing later on. Um, if you really would like to fully integrate this, um, add to the geodata harvester package, um, there are a couple of more steps to do. Um, there is a guideline for how to build basically those packages. Uh, let me find this one quickly, and I post it in the chat, how to add data sources. Uh, online, I'll just post this in the chat. Um, that's a rough guideline how to um, how to put like any new data source if we'd like to update a certain data source um, to it. And we have also some contributing guidelines, um, which can be also very helpful if you would like to contribute to this project, uh, which doesn't have to be just a new data source model, which can be pretty complex. Um, but also any bug reports issues, or if you would like to um, improve some of the code bases. Um, so basically um, the standard ways um, can um, submit an issue for certain, certain bugs, or if you would like to contribute. Uh, we, are taking, we are taking for granted that uh, everyone can use uh, GitHub, but uh, if, you, mm. if you can't, feel free to send us an email the old fashioned way too. But, um, yeah, GitHub is kind of where we manage the, the code and uh, yeah, the ideal way is to go on issues and say new issues and say hey, something's wrong. Um, so keep that in mind. Sorry, Sam. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's all to it. Um, any more questions? Well, yeah, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending today. So if there aren't any more questions, um, that's OK. Just make sure you fill out that that survey um, uh, if you can now. And uh, we'll, we'll send out the, the recording for today's session. Um, we'll keep updating the notes and everything. Um, but feel free to, to reach out uh, if you have any questions or follow-ups or, or feature requests or anything. And we'll see how we go. 
So thank you very much, everyone, and have a really good day. Thanks, Nate.